Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the third day of the Knowledge Forum at the Asian Development Bank. This is a very special session for us because it shows how far we came with knowledge management at the Asian Development Bank. We started uh, to do knowledge management around 20 years ago when we had our first knowledge management frameworks and plans around that time. We came a long way since then, and now with this new knowledge management action plan for 2021 to 2025, we are taking knowledge management to a next level. We are measuring knowledge management. We are linking culture and people, process and systems and relationships with knowledge management. All of this is underpinned by a theory of change, and we want to make sure that we standardize, institutionalize, and enhance the quality of how we do knowledge management. It is our great pleasure to hear today from the auditors what this means for us and uh, how we can ensure that be this becomes a standard process in ADB's business processes. And so we have with us today, Dr. Patricia Eng. She is one of the very few um, auditors for the ISO knowledge management standard 3031, 3041. Um, she has a very interesting background. She's an engineer by background. She has worked at NASA. She has worked at the Nuclear um, uh, Regulatory Commission in the United States. And she had led uh, various knowledge management programs there and saved millions of dollars for the U.S. government. Um, she will tell us her journey, how she got into knowledge management and why it is important to put a quality and deep auditing process behind our knowledge management efforts. After Patricia, we'll hear from Huan Zhu what this means for our corporate results framework. And then it's our great pleasure to hear from Yuko, our Auditor General, how we will embrace auditing knowledge management um, in ADB's processes. So I'm very happy to hand now over to Patricia, please. Thank you, Suzanne. It is a pleasure. It's truly a pleasure to be with you today. I will say that I have seen several of the previous expert talks, and I am absolutely blown away with the breadth and scope and commitment that ADB has to knowledge management. Um, before we start, Patricia, maybe um, I know we get into your presentation uh, in a moment. Uh, but maybe you can um, share a bit about your your journey and uh, what knowledge management uh, auditing means for you. Oh, wow. The thing about auditing, and particularly auditing to an ISO standard, first of all, the ISO standard sets up an international um, consensus standard. The standard was created by basically 55 countries had input into it. And the definitions and the requirements um, establish something that anybody in any country can work towards. If you're certified to an ISO standard, I think you know that um, everybody in the world knows what that means. And um, the thing about being an auditor is you have to adhere to the requirements of the standard. You can't make things up. You have to make sure that there's objective evidence and that objective evidence meets the requirements of the standard. Yeah, so I think Aja, what you said is, and we'll go into the depths of this now, and I hope people here um, understand why this auditing is so important, because what we see in the bank is often a, um, a fragmented approach to how we do knowledge management at various levels, right? It's not necessarily standardized. So to really implement the knowledge management action plan, we have to look at how we standardize, how we can roll it out, and how we can make sure it's not dependent on individuals that these knowledge management Absolutely. actions are implemented, right? And that's why, I mean, I'm Suzanne, so excited I, about this process. So, uh, Patricia, I, I can't agree with you more. Right? So I can't I'm, agree I'm, with you more. Yeah. So let's go through so your you... through your um, fantastic talk. Um, YKM, this is something that I found in the ADB action plan, and I was thrilled to see it because I've never seen such a comprehensive, coherent um, expression of YKM 
for ADB. You want to increase collaboration. You want to improve the quality of your knowledge services. And you want to expedite greater knowledge sharing so you can make a real impact in the developing member countries. I think that's an absolutely fabulous goal. And I was so happy to hear the two vice presidents, and I'll probably mess up how he pronounces the Pre Vice President Susan Tono and Vice President Lavasa, they both gave five points, and those five points were very aligned with and expanded on these three points. But let's talk about why KM really. What is, is KM important? Can I have the next slide, please? What's wrong with this picture? Can you see that there, the wires on the left don't meet the wires on the right? Um, this was the Airbus A380. This was an issue that was put into the news um, some years ago in 2006. And without going into detail, because I, I now have to accelerate the pace of my talk, um, the bottom line was, if you can go to the next slide, the electrical system was that was designed in two countries, France and in Germany. Everybody used the same software. The problem was everybody didn't use the same version of the software. And anybody who's done an upgrade from Windows 7 to Windows 10 will tell you things just don't work out the same. Um, but the, the, the previous slide, and don't go back there, but the previous slide shows you what the results of not making sure you're all on the same page, you're all talking to each other, and you're all working together can do. If you go to the next slide, my next example is with Cadbury. Cadbury makes licorice. Now, I, I could go into the nice technical details, but I won't bore you with that. The bottom line is the licorice gets cooked. And when, depending on when you got your sugar from your supplier, if it was in the beginning of the season or at the end of the season, the sugar didn't have a high enough sugar content. So the supplier would add a heat sensitive enzyme to the sugar. And by doing that, you would have enough sugar at room temperature, but when you cooked it, the enzyme would dissociate, the sugar would turn into starch, the licorice would not set. So Cadbury wound up throwing a lot of product out the window, they couldn't use it. Um, they did have a nice young microbiologist who said, oh, you cook it, doesn't work, probably has to do with a heat sensitive enzyme. Just check the sugar when it comes in, and if you see the enzyme, reject the sugar. Problem solved. Everything was fine. They had no more wastage. Fantastic. The young microbiologist moved on to a different job in Cadbury. They moved the factory, did not move the staff with the factory. Did anybody write that down? No. So a year later, what happens? All of a sudden, their licorice isn't working anymore. Long story short, they finally found the microbiologist about a year later. And if you can go to the next slide, he said, I told you once, I told you twice, you need to write down when the heat stabilizing enzyme is present, the sugar will deteriorate and just reject the sugar. I don't know how much money Cadbury lost by not writing it down, but they did lose some money. And that was an opportunity that was lost. So let's took it, take a look at two instances where KM works. If I could have the next slide, please. I'm going to talk about something at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission where I worked. Uh, we did nuclear safety for nuclear power plants, fuel fabrication facilities, and some other facilities I can't talk about. And I'm going to talk about a company named Arup, and I believe that ADB does business with Arup. So if we go to the next slide. Yeah. Okay. After this this event called 9/11. Um, we at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission told all of our nuclear facilities, you will implement more stringent security measures for obvious reasons. Well, you know, trust but verify. I, I was an auditor back then too. So the inspector would go out, see what the power plant or the fuel facility had done, write it up, send it to the regional office. The regional office would send it to the headquarters project manager. The headquarters project manager would then send it to the headquarters technical reviewer. The technical reviewer would review it, make a decision, give the answer back to the headquarters project manager from the project manager from headquarters, go back to the region and the back to the inspector. On average, it took between 10 and 14 months to review and resolve a single issue. 
Well, that's 10 to 14 months that the facility is not as secure as it could be, right? Not happy. So um, I, I know a lot of these guys because I've been there for forever and talked to many of the inspectors and they were just really, really frustrated. And so I said to them, what is your pain point? What is it that I can do? Or is there anything I can do to make it easier for you? They said, yeah, we need to be able to talk to each other more quickly as opposed to going to the up, over and down um, type of communication. I'm sure ADB doesn't have any of those problems, right? You share information seamlessly, um, really fast, and it's really wonderful. So well, I created a community of practice for the inspectors, just for the inspectors. Um, so they could talk to each other. So the inspectors in region one could talk to the region's inspector five, in region five. So they could talk about, hey, you know, I just got an approval for this particular fix. I think you'll probably get that approval too. Because if, if you approve one fix, that's good for everybody if they use the same fix. Bingo Bosco, the resolution times to be able to resolve whether or not one of the security fixes was okay, dropped from 10 to 14 months to three to six months. That is a significant increase. The inspectors were happy, the facilities were happy, and in my opinion, we were safer. Let's take a look at um, another example from ERA. Back in 2012, next one, thank you. Oh, you're reading my mind, this is great, you're hired. Um, in 2012, we experienced a thing called Hurricane Sandy, which brought an awful lot of rainfall um, and high water levels to New York City. New York City had never experienced this kind of flooding before. And as you can see from the pictures, it was significant. Um, the Metropolitan Transit Authority had never faced anything like this. The city was out of power. Most of the high-rise buildings, most of the offices could not function. They put out a call for proposals to help them resolve these issues. How can we get the water out of the subway and what can we do to make our subways more flood proof? Well, there were no offices, but Arup is a very forward thinking company. They had set up a couple of years before this, a skills network that was global so that anybody could reach out to anybody anywhere around the world with a question. So the engineer used his laptop and used his cell phone to ask through the skills network, does anybody have any information on what to do for a flooded subway? Next slide. Amazingly, an hour and a half after he put out that request, they got an answer from the people in Singapore. Yay, the people in Singapore had had this problem. Not only had they had the problem, but they'd worked on it. They had worked with the people in Singapore. They figured out how to get the water out of the subway and they sent all their information and, and pictures and everything you could possibly want to the people in New York City, right? Well, the people in New York City just stayed up all night. Engineers do that. And they prepared the proposal, submitted it to the Metropolitan Transit Authority. And guess what? They got the contract because not only did they have a fast response, but they also had diagrams, they had lessons learned, they had um, results from what happened. How did it work? So they, they really, really did a great job. And that's when knowledge management really does work. Solving a problem quickly with validated information. Next slide. So I've interviewed about 30 project managers around the world on knowledge management. And just take a look at this cartoon for a second. I think we all know that we need to identify and understand our stakeholders. Make sure you talk to your employees all the way down to the bottom because you know what, what is important for the people at the top is not the same as what's important for the people at the bottom. Following on that next slide, you gotta understand the pain points for all your stakeholders, the people at the top and the people at the bottom, because the pain points for each level is different. I will suggest to you that you pay particular attention to mid-level supervisors. The reason for that, if you think about being in the middle, you can think about it as being in a sandwich, but you're being pushed from the bottom, from the staff, the employees, and you're being pulled from the top, the CEOs and the vice presidents. 
you're getting pushed and pulled from all different directions. So the pain points and mid-level supervisors, and, and, and they're really the workhorses in your organization, you need to understand what their issues are. You need to figure out with it what's in it for them and meet those pain points. And of course, next slide, everybody wants you to make sure you have baselines and metrics. Not all of them are going to be, how much money did you save? Some of it's gonna be anecdotal. Ask somebody, how long does it take you to do this task? Okay, then implement your KM initiative or program or whatever. Wait a while and ask them again. How long does it take you to do that task? If it's now shorter, you've got to win. How about how satisfied are you with making this process happen? Same thing. Just take a look at what kinds of things you can use to measure how people are happy or how long it takes to do something. Um, and you can do all of those things. But as Suzanne alluded to earlier, um, you do it internally and you know from one company to another success looks different. How do you know you're really doing it right? Next slide. You, there are so many different organizations that offer certification and knowledge management. There's the KM Institute, there's APQC, there's SILIP, and I'm sure there's more that I'm not clear on. How do you know that you're doing it right? Who sets the standard? And I alluded to that a few moments ago. Next slide. ISO is very good at setting standards that serve at the international basis. Certification to ISO is recognized around the world as a significant achievement. And I will tell you that if ADB actually pursues certification to the ISO KM standard 30401, you will be, to the best of my knowledge, the first and only international organization to have the foresight and the energy to pursue certification to the ISO standard. There's nobody out there that is multinational that has even tried to take this on. ADB's already been certified to two ISO standards and maybe a third, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I'm sure somebody will tell you later. But you are somebody in your organization, probably Yuko, I bet you Yuko knows, what it takes to get certified to an ISO standard. It is not easy, but it is well worth the effort. Next slide. ISO standard 30401 is the knowledge management systems standard. It was developed by a technical committee that involved 55 countries, so it really is a consensus standard. The work began in 2014 and was issued in 2018, and the intent is to set sound KM principles and help you optimize your KM program. Um, they, they have, well, we're gonna to get to that in this slide, um, another slide just, the next slide actually. So the requirements are in these areas on the left. And actually that just kind of makes sense. Um, my personal view is that the top three, the context, leadership and planning, are the foundation of the standard and the support operation performance evaluation improvement is the execution. What ISO also did in order to help people understand what they meant is they created annexes. Annexes are additional information that are not requirements, but it does help you in your implementation of the standard. And my favorite is the relationship between KM and adjacent disciplines because it explains in clear terms, what's the difference between KM and information management? What's the difference between KM and, I don't know, name a, name a discipline, any discipline, organizational development, whatever. Um, and it's nice because if people ask you, what is KM and how is it different? You now have some place to go to say, this is what the difference is. Next slide. Now, KM is not for the faint of heart. I think you all know this, but the benefits are really, really worth it. What I would suggest that you do as you continue in your KM journey is to remember these three things. One, what is the value to the organization? Because if it doesn't bring value to the organization, I'm not so sure it's worth the effort to do it. It's got to align with the organization's values, their mission, et cetera, the strategic plan, five-year plan, 
whatever you have. And that's when I looked at your KM action plan, I was thrilled to see there's so many touchstones going back to this is who we as ADB are. This is what we want to do. I haven't seen that before anywhere. You guys are being commended for that. I'm absolutely astounded. The next thing is, what is the value to the individual? Yeah, we all work in organizations, but we're also individuals. They need to understand what value it brings to them, where they are, where they live, where they work. And most people don't think about this third thing, but you as the people who are implementing KM, what's in it for me? Why, why should I work so hard? And, and this is where Suzanne alluded to, I'm gonna tell you my story. Um, if you can go to the next slide, and it's gonna be bullet by bullet. So I'll, yeah, one bullet one, just hit the click, yeah. I've been working at the NRC for over 20 years. I'm a nuclear engineer. I love subatomic particles. I am not an HR person. I'm not an IT person. I'm an engineer. And uh, once upon a time, I got the chance to go work at NASA, ostensibly to build a nuclear powered rocket to go to Jupiter to look for water ice on the moons. We can talk about that, but not today. So if you go to the next bullet, just as I got there, they were retiring the space shuttle and they were building what they called the Ares Orion rocket. Looked amazingly like the Apollo rocket, but way bigger. Um, there was one small problem. Nobody had written down all of the technical details from the Apollo program. Most interestingly, the heat shield on the capsule that brings the astronauts back, that's kind of important if you're gonna send people into space. They couldn't find the recipe. Nobody remembered, nobody wrote it down. They were looking, they were calling retirees, they were looking all over, no documentation whatsoever. They spent over a billion dollars trying to recreate that heat shield. Now I will say in Ed Hoffman's defense, this happened before uh, Congress mandated that NASA start a knowledge management program. So you can't say, well, what about Ed? Well, he wasn't, he was there, but he wasn't in that role. So it's, it's not his fault. Okay, so next bullet. When I went back to the NRC, I said, hey, you know, I'm looking at what's going on in the NRC. 50% of our staff are eligible for retirement. What's gonna happen if they walk out the door? You know, hey, managers, we gotta do something about this. We, we've got to start training. We've got to start getting the information, the tacit information from our experts. And so, you know what happens? The squeaky wheel gets the grease. Next bullet. They created the senior advisor role for knowledge management and they stuck me in it. Now, did I tell you I'm an engineer? Okay. Uh, this is not the kind of problem I know how to solve. I will tell you that as a knowledge management person, I made every mistake you could possibly make. I did stupid, stupid things, um, but I, I persevered because I thought it was really important. I wanted to make sure we met our safety mission. I wanted to make sure that we did whatever we could to save uh, the knowledge before it walked out the door. And the first thing I did was, next bullet, I created an electronic knowledge center. What does that mean? Well, it means like a bunch of communities of practice that are all tied together and interrelated. Um, and I established the governance for it. And it was, you know, I made a lot of mistakes. Um, next bullet, I then identified what critical knowledge was walking out the door. Um, and then once I identified the critical knowledge, I identified the subject matter experts that we still, next bullet, had that we could talk to and interview and get whatever we could get out of their brains. It was a lot of work made a lot of mistakes but what i will tell you because we were a full fee agency i could tell you that i actually saved the nrc 57 million dollars in my first 18 months in operating costs um and actually i didn't even know i had done it somebody came to me and said do you realize that you saved all this money and i thought wow uh so that's an unintended consequence next bullet but there are more unintended consequences Waiting for the last book. There we are. Okay, so we can go to the, the next slide. We're going to do the same thing. Thanks very much to the producers picking up the slack here. Unintended consequences. First bullet. Okay, I did all this stuff. I got awards at work. So I have I have a whole pile of these nice certificates that I can hang on the wall that say, 
Patricia Ng did this wonderful thing. Okay, that's nice. I mean, we were government agency. We don't we don't get lots of money and you know perks and cars and we don't do that stuff. Um, but the things that were really cool. Next bullet is when I was asking people, how do you do things? How do you, I would call people anywhere in the world? Say, how do you do a community practice? This didn't work. What would you suggest I do? Do you, do you have any any things that that I can implement here? Some worked, some didn't. Okay, so next bullet. Next thing you know, because I started calling a whole lot of people, I was viewed as a KM expert. Yeah, I would point out that the word expert, okay? X means to go out of, and a spurt is nothing more than a drip under pressure. Now, I don't know if that translates real well, but hopefully it does. So I was an expert. I'm still making mistakes. But one thing about being an inspector for the NRC, next bullet, is I became the first certified 30401 auditor. I stood for a 16 hour oral exam and passed, which is pretty amazing. So 20 something odd years as an inspector and running NRC's knowledge management program, well, pretty cool. Um, and so what comes out of that next bullet? I get invited to speak at international conferences like this forum. I mean, I never in my wildest dreams expected to speak for such an august organization as ADB, but here I am. And it's it's really cool. I've I've been able to travel to some interesting places before COVID. And now I still meet wonderful people like Suzanne and, and her team, which and they've all been so nice to me. I don't know why, but they're being very nice to me. Um, but there's also one other unintended consequence. Um, next bullet. It's a bit, it's, yeah. Okay, next slide. Yeah, I didn't expect to do this, but it looks like I'm um, co-author of two books on knowledge management. Um, the one on the left is the book that I wish I had when I started because I wouldn't have made anywhere near the number of stupid mistakes that I made. Um, the one on the right, is um, with two of my very good friends and colleagues where we interview a number of successful program managers around the world. And between the two of them, I've talked to over 30 program managers from places from Arab, uh, Patronus, they have an amazing KM program, Shell, um, the International Olympic Committee. I mean, you know, if you think about it, they really need knowledge management about what worked in Rio versus what worked in Tokyo or what's this going to work in Beijing. Anyway, so there's some unintended consequences. You never know what's going to happen. Next slide. So that's my KM story. The question now is, where will your KM journey take you? Sky's the limit. Go for it. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Patricia. This was fantastic. I think you showed us your passion, why knowledge management matters. And I, I hope that all the knowledge focus are here and, and listen to that. You made a career out of it, but you also really um, supported your own organization to become a more efficient organization with higher quality uh, work processes. and. Um, and, and, and services. So that's that's fantastic. And thinking about the ISO standard for knowledge management, maybe before we go to Hwanju, one question for you, Patricia, why do you think this is so important um, to, to have the standard? Because if you get certified to the standard, everybody knows the requirements. You have met an international consensus agreement as to what makes a knowledge management program, a good, well-functioning KM program. I mean, if you if you talk to somebody in the United States, depending on who you talk to, um, they say, well, you know, we might have some communities of practice, et cetera, et cetera. But if you take a look at how the standard is broken down, leadership plays a big role. You have to understand the context of the organization. The people who wrote the standard did a phenomenal job of capturing all the different facets that affect the performance of a knowledge management program. And again, um, if ADB decides to go forward with it, you will be the first in the world and you will have one heck of a, a, a 
a lot of bragging rights and say, no, 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 look what we did. Um, there isn't a bank in the world right now that is even thinking about pursuing the standards. So for you to even think about it, that's absolutely amazing. And you are to be commended for because this is not for the faint of heart. I mean, it's, I'm an auditor. I, I, I know, <laughs> I know what it's like to, to have me walk in your door um, or whomever you decide to hire, but um, it's, it's the international standard. Nobody can argue with it. Yeah, standard. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. So maybe to <coughs> have some reflections, we'd now I'd like to hear from Juan Zhu who is a senior results management specialist in our strategy and policy department, a bit of what we are doing already to measure our progress in, um, in, uh, in knowledge management. And maybe Patricia, I know maybe you can keep the camera on for a bit because then I think the visual is a bit better um, before we go. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and so let's hear from Wanju. I hope you can share your slides and please audience uh, pop your questions in the chat box and we'll come to your questions um, after here from Huanju and from Yuko. So we are, we are waiting for Huanju. Let's see if we have here already some questions coming in. Um, um, I'm asking here, Patricia, there's already one question coming in and that's from Benedict Giuliano. And he's asking, can you give an estimate as how much an organization should invest in case we want to pursue the ISO KM standard 3041? Management will always ask for how much when presenting a case study for this? Do you have any good answer for that? I really wish I could give you an answer. I, I think um, it depends on how mature you are and how open you are to reading the standard. I think one of the things that would help is for you to, first of all, you have to buy the standard. That's how ISO makes its money. You cannot copy the standard. You cannot give the standard away. You have to buy it. Um, and if you're going to do it for your organization, I would suggest that you contact your um, standards organization for your country and get a company-wide copy of the standard. There is such a thing. Um, I, 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 that way you can share the standard with everybody who works in, in your organization. The next thing that I would do is to um, read the standard, see if you can find somebody who can explain to you what the requirements are and then um, if you know somebody who is an ISO auditor for say 9001 or another management system standard, you can ask them, okay, so take a look at this standard. What would you say uh, would be appropriate objective evidence to meet this particular requirement? Uh, there's a requirement in there that asks you to do an analysis of your internal and external stakeholders. If you're a small company, the internal stakeholders might be all four, five employees in your company. But if you're something like ADB, that, that, that's a little bit of a bigger challenge. And the question is, what kind of an analysis do you want to do? How in depth? Mm -hmm. So I wish I could give you a one size fits all answer, but it really is dependent on your organization and how big it is. Yeah, and maybe to Patricia, what you said, right? Uh, I think another opportunity is you send some people to a training on how to interpret the standard. Uh, that's something we are, we will do with Patricia so that we have a better um, uh, understanding of what it takes to go through this audit and, and what should be in place. Like, Patricia, I'm looking here if there are more questions. Okay, here, there's one more question from DB and that is organizational culture has always been touted as the greatest barrier on the flip side, facilitators of knowledge management. So culture barrier, but also facilitator. What are actionable steps small organizations can take to build an organizational culture that facilitates knowledge management? Do you have like from your cookbook, like two recipes to enhance organizational culture? No, sadly, I don't have anything from the cookbook, but what I can tell you is to take a look at the annex in the standard, they talk about what is a good KM culture. And th what I have found is that people are resistant to an initiative. It's usually because A, they don't understand it. B, they think it's coming from the top down. It doesn't mean anything. It's not going to last. And C, they don't see the value in it for them. If you can show them the value of, of whatever program it is, and if you can have some kind of a reward for them to participate, 
I think it'll help. But you know, culture is so difficult to work on. It's not something that I can explain really quickly. But I think that people who people react better to carrots than sticks. Yes. So if you figure out what's in it for them, yeah, and and get to them at their level, I think that would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Hello. Hi, Juan, Juan Ju, are you ready? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So um, I'll just come back to your questions later. Let's hear quickly from Juan Ju uh, what's happening with our indicators and our adaptive management system. I think we are very proud of what we are doing already in measuring our knowledge management activities and our progress. At, at least uh, Juan Ju and I are very proud of it. So Juan Ju, uh, over to you. Yes, thank you, Suzanne. So let's go to slide two. Um, I'm very happy to join the talk today. My name is Hyun Chu and I do results management at ADD. More specifically, I help my colleagues to design projects better and I review ADD's corporate progress towards achieving the development goals expressed in the ADD's long-term strategy. Today, I wanna to talk about two things, how we measure ADD's performance in knowledge management and how knowledge management, when done properly, can enhance the way we manage and achieve results. Next slide, please. So we just learned from Patricia that knowledge management can help us to improve the way we work. The results management also heavily rely on knowledge management by bringing together knowledge and expertise within and outside of the project. Just like knowledge management, results management needs to be backed by business process that is efficient and our projects will need to generate quality knowledge products and services that are using um, in, in that are useful to solving uh, development challenges faced by our client countries. And we know a project is making a good impact when the knowledge and the lessons generated from the projects are shared and used by our stakeholders. Therefore, the quality of knowledge results management is very much dependent on how well we do knowledge management. Next slide, please. So here I want to briefly talk about how we do the adaptive management. So when we manage our projects at ADB, we monitor its progress and when necessary, we adjust our actions so that our expected goals are, our goals are, our goals can be achieved. And we call this adaptive management because project officers use the lessons and goals and good practices collected during project implementation to course correct things that may derail the project implementation and its ability to achieve desired outcome. Next slide, please. And as Susan mentioned, when we monitor the performance at ADB, including the, our knowledge work, first we measure using a set of indicators designed to assess our organizational effectiveness, which includes systems and processes and people's capacity. Second, um, the performance and the quality of our new and ongoing operations. Third and finally, the effects of ADB's operations generated in our client countries, looking at the completed operations uh, and their results. Next slide, please. So to know the quality of ADB's knowledge enterprise uh, that is aligned with our value statement articulated in strategy 2030, we use a set of indicators that are designed to assess the experience and the views from our clients, experts, and ADB staff. Knowing the quality of our knowledge work and its technical usefulness is crucial for us. In 2020, when we asked our clients about the relevance, the usefulness, and the applicability of ADB's knowledge solutions, 79% of our clients said they're happy with the use of ADB's knowledge products and services. But however, we scored it red, meaning we're off track. And let me explain why. Some may say in, it's almost 80%, so ADB is doing fairly okay. But as ADB, as the knowledge institution, we think we can do more. So we set our minimum threshold at 80% satisfaction rate every time we measure our client satisfaction rate. So I think this is actually a very good story to tell because it shows that our indicators are designed to incentivize our performance and it gives us valuable information which we can use to improve our next year's operations. And then finally, we ask our staff how they think of ADB's knowledge management, whether it is helping them to achieve their, their job, I mean, achieve the result and to do their jobs better. 
And this year, we will upgrade our knowledge management assessment tool to measure ADB's knowledge maturity so we can track our performance as we work to improve our knowledge management. Next slide, please. Okay, so that was a like real quick run. Um, so far, we looked at the results management process at ADB and how we use the performance indicators as an important learning tool. Like Patricia mentioned in her presentation, what's equally important is the people, the community of practice, the middle managers, the staff on the front line, using those lessons learned collected um, from the projects and also actively engaging in conversations to influence and to change the way we work. Therefore, as we continue to work towards improving ADB's performance, we want to continue to empower our community of practice in knowledge and results management so that they can continue to challenge us and our development partners to engage in constructive and sometimes difficult conversations that can help us to learn more and achieve more. Finally, as we improve the way we do manage, uh, knowledge management, we expect uh, to see many small changes happening across ADB that leads to a greater impact in Asia and the Pacific. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Thank you so much, Anju. I think you described very well how we are connecting the business process with the ultimate um, goal, and that is to have a better development impact in our member countries and how this is a iterative process. I think there were a few good points here. And before I invite Yuko to provide her thoughts and reflections, maybe um, one question for Patricia and also for you. What, when do we know if lessons learned are not relevant anymore? What, what process do we need for that? Patricia, do you want to go first? That's a that's a that's a really good question. Um, and to be honest with you, I would have to think about that. I can't do a, a on the fly answer. Um, the only thing that comes to my mind is that there's a lesson learned with a, about a product that you no longer use, and obviously that is uh, no longer valid. But I think that's something that the organization has to determine whether or not. Well, gee, you know, do we really need to do this? Does this really apply anymore? Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that. And Hyunju, do you do you have any suggestions, or, or maybe yeah. maybe Yuko, in her vast experience as an auditor general, but may have some examples from some of her previous experiences. So, how do we know when our lessons learned are no longer useful? We would only know by talking to the frontline officers. Yeah. They're the one who knows the reality of the project. The, the actual challenge that they face on a daily basis. So mm -hmm. we would know whether the lesson that we're recommending, whether that's useful or not, only if we ask those people who actually implement and use those information as they improve the project performance. Yeah, which comes back to the feedback loops, right? And maybe one last question before Yuko, uh, we come to you. Maybe Yuko, you can turn on your camera already so we make sure everything uh, works well. And um, that question is like with any other ISO certification, Patricia, right, for also for this ISO standard, you decide the scope, like who you want to certify. Is it just the knowledge management team? Is it a certain department? Um, maybe a few um, reflections on that question. It was about-, about uh, Me, who, yeah. me or Yuko? Yeah, yeah, maybe Patricia, and then I go to Yuko. Um, the nice thing about the ISO, the ISO standard is you can say, well, let's say you, Suzanne, your work unit, you want to certify that work unit, in which case the audit would concentrate just on your work unit and your immediate interactions with people, your, your customers, your products, etc. cetera. Um, I think that is probably the best way to start for any large organization because to try to do all of adb at one go yeah. um i would have to I, I i can only imagine that a team of i don't know 10 to 15 auditors would have to interview so many people in adb um i think it makes more sense to go ahead and certify a small um, core group and have that group uh, function and then perhaps they can do internal auditing not only of themselves but also other groups and help them get ready for possible certification in the future but yuko you you're you're the auditor general i mean you know you are the all end all be all what what are your thoughts on this 
Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you very well, Yuko. Okay. Yeah. Thank, so, so thank you, you so much. Yep. Yeah. If you then um, I'd like to offer my reflections, you know, um, after listening uh, Patricia and uh, Hyunju's uh, presentations, and I'm very inspired by Patricia's journey, right? Um, based on the practical um, problems, uh, solutions, and solving, and uh, you know, a try and error uh, approach, right? So that is very inspiring, and I'm also very impressed. Um, with uh, ADB's commitment uh, to knowledge management by setting um, the targets or the measurements, right? Because without measurement, actually you can't achieve anything. You can't get to the desired uh, results. So uh, um, setting a you know, measurement indicator is a very good signal um, uh, for, from top management on on this, uh, you know, journey of knowledge management. So my question is that: uh, What kind of contribution internal audit can make um, in this knowledge management journey? So uh, for those who are not very familiar with internal audit, I will just uh, I'd like to uh, provide you know what internal audit does at a very high level. So internal audit is an independent objective assurance and the consulting activity designed to add values and improve organization's operations. So that is our mandate. So our job is to help organizations to improve their activities. And it helps organizations accomplish its objectives by bringing a systematic and disciplined approach to evaluate and improve effectiveness in risk management controls and governance processes. So, and the, the scope of our work um, is actually quite vast. So any business activities that are material for the achievement of organization's objective, it's within internal audit scope. So if knowledge management uh, is the heart of um, the, the ADB strategy 2030, then it will come into our scope, right? We have to uh, audit. But the challenge is that uh, knowledge management is um, relatively nubious, uh, uh, nebulous concept. It, it's different from procurement activities where you can test Right? Uh, whether this is done, well, this passed, you know, whether this complied with this requirement, it's not like that. And as the ISO standards uh, rightly say, uh, knowledge management means different things in different organizations. It can be designed in a different way. So there is no one you know, set model. So that makes audit uh, quite challenging. However, um, ISO certifications actually requires internal audit, uh, does um, knowledge management audit on a regular basis. So we have to develop you know, our approach uh, to look at the knowledge management. So I, um, I put some thoughts, you know, where we can look at um, to help organizations to um, you know, get to the maturity in knowledge management. I think that there are three areas that we can uh, contribute. One is governance and accountability framework. So um, how the implementation of knowledge management action plan um, is uh, um, structured. You know, who is accountable? You know, who, who sets the tone? Who makes business plans? Who put money? Right? So there should be a governance framework around it and accountability framework. So, and, and the, uh, the measurement of results is part of it. It's a part of governance um, arrangement. The second um, the area is ena enabling the processes and the systems. So um, once management or leadership decide, okay, let's, uh, let's implement um, knowledge management, we need the infrastructure. So for example, a uh, good example is information classifications. So ADB recently uh, in, uh, implemented a new information classification, uh, right? And without 
um, knowing whether this is a confidential information, this is restricted, this is a public, you know, staff do not have confidence uh, for sharing um, information or knowledge with others. So from that perspective, information classification is very important enabling factor, right? And the next one is policy and the procedure framework. And uh, I think this uh, actually answers to the um, Susan's questions. You know, how do we know that the knowledge became obsolete? I think uh, knowledge should be embedded in policies and the procedure. And as uh, we acquire new knowledge, right, policy and the uh, pro procedures needs to be updated constantly. So we need a system uh, to update and the discard, right, um, the policy and the procedures. So I think this is another enabling element. And another thing is learning program. Uh, what is the staff's learning program, right? So uh, this is a, 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 another um, element. Information systems that support collaborations, right? So we have uh, teams, we use teams and you know, WebEx, so, the, this technology is also important. Also, we need a technology information system that stores knowledge, uh, technology to, for knowledge retrieval, right? Data governance and the public disclosure of information knowledge. So they, those are enabling. And the, lastly, uh, production of knowledge products themselves, it, itself. So what is the control over production, the production of knowledge? products so that so i can think of those the, the three areas that we can probably contribute and lastly um internal audit reports themselves are knowledge products in my view right that offers good learning uh points and so uh, organizations should use internal audit as a learning tool and uh, um to create a continuous um improvement culture within the organization so that is my reflection susan a wonderful yuko I, I think this is fantastic and you being able to um provide these three points and point to our audit processes shows i think how serious we are and how we recognize that knowledge management is part of all our business processes and we need to monitor assess and iterate these processes. And as we are going through this large organizational transformation, I think there is a huge opportunity to do so and share this kind of learning, right? I mean, again, the whole conference topic is learning through change. And that's what, what we are doing. Uh, and we need, of course, you and the internal auditors, your whole team um, to walk us through this and, and have this learning experience. So I think looking at the comments here, um, I can see we've probably covered most of them. Um, and I'm looking here, it, does anyone have something else? Would you like to raise your hand and step on the stage um, and voice your question here? I can pull you up. You just have to raise your hand and then to the moderation panel, I can pull you up on the stage. Any questions here? I also want to uh, remind everyone we have a poll uh, so you can share with us if you found the session interesting. Um, ah, what auditor, okay, what auditor you mean? Our auditor general, Yusuf has a question. What auditor you mean? We mean our auditor general. Auditor check financial report, okay, Yusuf. Well, maybe you could ask for another discussion about uh, the different roles of the auditor, um, the auditor general. Um, to ask questions, okay. So um, we have two more minutes. Um, I suggest um, that we wrap up the session here. I think the key messages we provided through Patricia is number one, knowledge management is not nebulous. Um, there is a, uh, <laughs> I want to debunk this myth, okay? It's nothing nebulous, it's something very solid. It can be measured. Um, there are ways to measure the international standards. Uh, ADB is embarking on the journey uh, to um, comply with international standards. This is a learning process. We are working closely with the Auditor General to make sure it becomes part of ADB's uh, internalized processes. And Juan Ju stands here for us to say we are measuring the results, not only our impact with our clients, but also how we as an organization become more efficient, of higher quality, and also, I think, something we hadn't discussed yet, more innovative, because that requires a learning process. So with that, I thank you, ladies, for this fantastic conversation. 
We're looking forward to more. For the audience here, what to I want to announce, would like to announce that we are now planning a training program with Patricia Eng in close collaboration, of course, with Yuko also on how to interpret and understand the knowledge management ISO standard, because only then can we uh, discuss and uh, consider if we embark on the certification process. So with that, I wish you all a fantastic rest of the day. Please enjoy the sessions that are coming up. There is one on action research because we are also linking this certification process with action research. We are working with McGill University um, to look at what works and what doesn't. Um, and hopefully we can share this with all development organizations here and with government agencies. And um, I'll see you back later. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you, Yuko. Thank you, Wanju, for being here today and for being patient with the technology. Bye-bye.